Right, so in this video, we're going to take a look at the tile pattern options that we have inside of Copernicus. And these are going to be extremely useful for anything like bricks or floor tiles or mosaics. There really are so many options that become available to us when we have access to these tiling patterns. Now, this video is going to be a bit more oriented towards the intermediate level. So if any of this is a bit too complicated for you, please feel free to check out the organic texturing series that I did. That one is more introductory for Copernicus or COPS. So in this video, we're going to be creating a brick texture. To begin with, we're going to go over to the stage level. Right over here, we can just create a SOP create node. This is where we'll create a piece of geometry to actually add our textures to. So in here, we'll create a grid, flip it up onto the XY plane, shrink it down slightly, two by two, with 200 columns and 200 rows, something like that. Then a UV project, just to add UVs to this. Go over to the Initialize tab and click on Initialize. That's all we have to do over here. Rename this to Wall. Now we can use a quick surface material, and this is just going to be used to apply a material to our wall and also give us access to the COP network. Over here, we can rename this to Brick Material, and then we can use an Assign Material after that to assign our brick material to our wall. So forward slash wall is the primitive and the material path is forward slash materials forward slash brick material. There we go. So now it is applied. The next step is to go to our brick material and actually enable the maps that we need to be generated inside of Copernicus. So we can set or create a color map over here. And on the right hand side, we're going to say create cop texture for this map. Once we do that, it will create a cop network. And this is going to contain all of the maps needed for the brick material. So let's scroll down to specular, roughness map, set or create, right hand side, create a cop network, scroll down all the way to bump, enable this one over here. So set or create bump height map, once again, creating a map inside of the Copernicus network. So all of these are now linked to nodes inside of the Copernicus network. Now inside of COPS, we have these nodes available to us. You can see that we have a base color, a specular roughness, and a bump height. So any changes that we make to the inputs of these three will reflect on our actual material. A useful thing to do over here is to just press C. This is going to bring up our colors and let's just make these red. We can then delete these checkerboards and we now have our base color, spec roughness, and bump height. And now we can just connect things into this. So let's begin with actually creating some tiles. If we use the tile pattern node, right over here and set our display flag, we'll end up with this uniform grid. Now, this is based off of the pattern type that we have inside of the tile pattern. Over here, we have stack bond. The one that we're looking for is actually the stretcher bond, but you can go through these. For example, there's French patterns and herringbone, and there's just loads and loads of patterns that we can use for all sorts of use cases. So we're going to use stretcher bond because this is going to be the most useful for a brick texture. And now we can take a look at the outputs that we have on our tile pattern. The first one is of course, this black and white image. This we can mostly treat as a mask. It's going to be mostly used as a mask or a multiply, but really the actual useful functionality comes from the ID and the UV. So if we switch to ID, you'll see that each one of these tiles has a unique ID. And if a tile gets cut off, in the case of this purple one in the top left or the blue one on the left over here, you can see that it continues over on the right hand side. That just means that this is also seamless. So if we were to scale this up or down, you won't see a seam at the edges of this texture. The other option that we have is the UV. Now UV is going to be extremely useful and this might look strange to you over here, but I'll explain how we use it. All this is, is a UV space per tile. So that means that we can uniquely manipulate each one of these UVs and each tile can sample a texture in a different way because it has a different UV. So just to give you an idea of how this actually works, I'm going to show you an example. You don't have to follow along with this, but it is really useful to know. So let's say that we have a fractal noise. So if we take a look at this noise without any position plugged into it, this is the noise that we have, but we can also plug in a UV map over here. So we create a UV map. We plug this in to the position and we should have the exact same noise. So even if we disable our UV map, we have the same noise. And that just means that this defaults to this UV map, right? So it uses this UV map to generate a noise. However, if we make adjustments to this UV with a UV transform, you'll see that the noise is also adjusted. So if I use this UV transform, and then let's just say it rotate, you'll see that the noise pattern also rotates. Now, why is that important? Well, that just means that we can make adjustments to UV spaces and actually end up with varied noises. Now, what exactly is a UV space or a UV map like this? Well, if we just reset our view so that we're facing it from the correct angle, what this is, is a vector two. 
where X is represented by this red color and Y is represented by this blue color. You can see that both of those values are zero in the bottom left, so that would be zero, zero. As we move up, the Y value increases, so it becomes more blue. So as we move up, it'll go from zero, zero to zero, one. And as we move to the right, it'll go from zero, zero to one, zero. But as we move to the top right, it'll go from zero, zero to one, one. And that's all that we really need to know about this UV space. Now that means that we have loads and loads of options for how we actually manipulate this. For example, if I were to use a mirror, so let's mirror this UV, you can see that it's the same on the left and the right. If you feed that into a noise, your noise is actually mirrored too. The left is the same as the right. And one thing to take note of is that this isn't related to the UVs on our geometry in any way. This is just the value that we're creating and using as a position for things like noises. So now that we have that understanding, what do we have on this tile pattern? Well, each and every one of these tiles has its own UV space, ranging from 0, 0 to 1, 1. All that means is that if we plug this into our position for our fractal noise, you'll see that this noise is repeated for each and every tile. And that might not be so obvious if our element size is so small. If I push it up, you can see that it gets repeated over and over again. Now, we're going to be manipulating these UVs, but it would be nice if we had a way of actually visualizing them, right? Because this isn't all that intuitive. So a useful thing that we can do is use the UV sample node. We take our UVs into the first input and into the texture input, we can use a file node. So the file node by default is going to load in this butterfly. But if you change the name up here to UV grid underscore gray, and that's gray with an E, you'll have this over here, which you can plug into the texture and now use that for visualizing your UVs. So now we can see that each tile has its own UVs. Now, if we were to adjust each one of these tiles, we can use the UV transform node. But you will see that if I attempt to go down to the randomized section where you would think that this would work, if we do something like a rotation, all of the tiles rotate in the same way. Same thing with the uniform scale or the max scale, all of that's the same. That's because this requires a seed for randomization. So if we plug the ID into the seed, then this is going to allow us to cause randomizations per tile. So now if we reduce the uniform minimum scale and increase the uniform max scale and do things like rotations, you'll see that we have different UVs for each and every tile. Now this is really cool because we can actually take this and plug this into our noise and it will generate these varied tiles. You can also change the seed value over here because I find that I don't like the pattern that it's creating diagonally. So we can just shuffle this around until we have a pattern that we're happy with, right? Something like that. Cool. So I'm just going to make some changes to our fractal noise, reducing the amplitude slightly, just like that. Now let's add further variation to each one of these tiles or bricks by using the ID. We're going to do a random, so random mono, and we're going to have to take our ID into the seed value. When we do that, we'll end up with this over here. And then we can take that into a multiply and we can multiply the noise that we've generated with this random mono. Make sure that your noise is into the first input and your mono is into the second because we want to reduce the influence that the foreground has by reducing the mask over here. So we can reduce it slightly, something like that. Now we've got some really good variation per tile. Now we can even further this variation by going over to our tile pattern over here, going down to the bottom, and let's add some variation to our rotation and size for each of our tiles. Let's go ahead and set varying for uniform scale. We'll reduce the uniform scale slightly and add some variation so that each one has its own variation as well, something like that. Then we can go over here to the rotate tile. Once again, set varying. We don't want such a huge rotation. We only want something of about one degree. So very slight rotational randomization, adjusting the seed, and then we have something like that. Now we've got some really good variation going on. We also have these spaces between our bricks, and it would be nice if we could add some detail in between there. So let's go ahead and do that. All we're going to do for that is use a fractal noise. The fractal noise over here, we can decrease the center and decrease the amplitude, scroll down to the bottom and increase the roughness. Now, how are we going to make sure that this noise only appears in these crevices or gaps? Well, we're going to be using the tile output as a mask. So we can use a blend, take the tile into the mask, into the first input, we'll take our noise, into the second input, we'll take our tiles, and that over there will only apply this noise wherever this mask is. So wherever this mask is white, we'll end up with our tiles. Wherever this mask is black, we'll end up with our noise. So we can make further adjustments from here, darkening the spaces between our tiles, something like that. All right, now these areas around our bricks are perhaps too uniform. So how about we chip away at some of these bricks? Now, how would we do that? 
Well, what we can do is we can actually expand our tile pattern out. So that would be a good start. So we can use a dilate or erode and we're going to want to erode. So reduce the radius to a negative value. We'll reduce it quite a lot initially. Then we're going to invert this so that we have this over here. Now we can multiply this with a noise. So if we use a multiply and another fractal noise, we're going to increase the amplitude on our noise, increase its contrast, increase our roughness slightly. And now we're going to once again invert this back or we can use a remap. So we'll use a remap over here. Plugging this into our remap, we'll flip the ramp around, right? So it's the reverse of what we had. And now we can do a minimum operation with our mask, right? So this over here, where we use this as a mask, let's do a minimum operation with what we just created. So if we use a minimum, the minimum between this and the output from our tiles will give us this over here. You can see that it's kind of eating away towards the edges and that's pretty good. So all we have to do now is make some changes to our remap. So we don't want these in-between values. So we end up with something like that, right? So now we're eating away at the edges of these bricks. And if we don't want such a sharp edge, all we have to do is blur the one where we dilated or eroded. So this one over here, you can put a blur in between, increasing the blur slightly, and it'll give you less of these sharp edges. So that's a much nicer mask to work with. So let's make an adjustment, a blend where we're going between our bricks and the noise pattern. Let's just replace what we're using as the mask with this new updated one over here. Now things are going to get a bit messy because we still have some more work to do. So let's separate everything out a little bit. Over here, we'll just make a box around these and we'll just call this mask. In the middle over here, we'll call this tiles. And we can also put our random mono in there. And then at the bottom over here, we can just call this one grout. And now we have everything set up pretty well. One thing that I'd like to do is also just blur the incoming tiles over here. So the one that we're fetching from our tile pattern, the edges are extremely sharp. So let's just go ahead and use a blur right over here just to soften those edges very slightly something like that. That's just going to help when we actually use this for displacement, which we can actually test right now. So let's plug that into our bump height and go up a level. So our bump scale is very low and we don't have true displacement. So enable true displacement and let's push up our bump scale to 0.3. If we go around to the front, we'll now see that we have these bricks standing away from the surface. Now we do also have an issue where it's still using the old materials or the old maps. So we can also update the other two. Let's go ahead and take this blend and use it for specular roughness and base color as well. But we may want to make some adjustments. So the first thing that we'll do is a remap over here, flipping the ramp around and lifting up the low end and then using that for our specular roughness. And as for our color, we'll get around to doing that properly. But for now, we can just feed this straight in. So go up a level and that's what we have. Again, you're going to end up with some very shiny bricks. And the way to fix that is by just increasing your roughness to a value of one because this acts as a multiplier of your map. And we can test this if we just reduce these values over here for our roughness. You'll see that it starts to get shiny again. So that's just a multiplier for the roughness of the bricks. So I'm just going to reduce the bump scale to 0.1 and that's already looking pretty good. Now, the next thing that we may want to do is work on our base color. So once again, we're going to use a height to ambient occlusion. It's just an extremely useful node for generating lots of detail, pushing up the height scale and slightly playing around with our view radius until we have something like that. Then we can take that into a multiply. We'll take this blend over here into the background, the height to ambient occlusion into the foreground. And now with this multiply, we can just adjust the masking. Now, a useful node to use before we put this into a color ramp, which I didn't mention before to avoid any confusion, is just an equalize node. So if we grab an equalize node, we can change this to not stretch to black and white, but to scale to the maximum length. So it'll now range from zero to whatever the maximum brightness is. This just means that we now have a range of values which fit really well into a ramp. So if we do a ramp RGB, plugging this into position, we can now push up the low end and make some adjustments over here. Now, what I will say is don't worry about the grouting right now because we do have masks that we can use for actually switching between this and a separate texture for our grout. So let's just change until we have the color that we want for our bricks, which is going to be a brownish red. And we just wanna maximize the detail that we're getting out of this. So something like that. Now let's just duplicate this ramp and we can rename each one of these. This one will be bricks. This one will be grout. And this one over here, we can now adjust. So let's make this a lighter color. And keep in mind, all we're trying to do in this one is bring out the detail in between the bricks. 
Now to merge these two together, we use a blend. And once again, we're going to have to use our mask to define the difference over here. So we have our mask over here. All we have to do is plug it into this. And I got my inputs the wrong way around. So just make sure that your bricks are second input and your grout is first input, just like that. Now we can replace our base color with that. And now if we go up a level, our bricks are starting to look really good. Now, the last thing that I want to show you is just a bit of a specific trick for bricks in particular. And that is just to add a bit of a radial pattern to the inside of each brick, a bit of a radial darkening. And this is a nice trick because bricks tend to have this darker area towards the center. And so to do that, we can go over here where we have our tile pattern. Once again, grabbing our UV. We're going to once again use a UV transform over here. And remember, if we want per tile transformations, grab your ID, plug it into seed. And with this, we're going to take a ramp. So a ramp mono, plugging this into the position. And you'll see that it generates a gradient for us. But that's not the gradient that we want. We actually want one that is concentric. So from the center, and then we're going to flip it, right? So we have that over there. Now in the UV transform, we're simply going to adjust the minimum and maximum scale for these, and then adjust the seed, something like that. And now we're going to use this as a mask as well. So what are we going to mask? Well, we're actually going to take our bricks and we're going to define a slightly darker area in the center. The way we're going to do that is with an HSV or U saturation value adjust. So we take this one over here and plug it in. Now for this one, we're going to reduce the value and do a bit of a U shift towards red, something like that. And now we're going to blend between these two using what we just created. So put your original bricks into the background, the darker one into the foreground, and then go down here and just grab your mask from this ramp over here. And now we can make some more adjustments. So as we push down this value scale, you'll see that darkening towards the center of each of these bricks. You can also make adjustments to the incoming values, something like that, and just replace this over here. And now we've got some really good looking bricks. You can see this sort of pattern over here where it's lighter towards the edges and darker in the center is something that would be quite difficult to get if you were making your materials any other way. But because we have this custom UV approach where we can distort our UVs per tile, we can achieve this really easily. So all that's left from here is something like a karma physical sky and a render geometry settings affecting forward slash wall, scrolling down to dicing, setting or creating, setting it to one to increase the resolution of our subdivisions. And now if we do a karma XP render, that's what we have. Now I did add extra details such as some cutouts and some breaking to my setup. So if you do want to see that, I will include my file down below for download and you can go through that one. There's just a couple of more things that I've done in there just to make it a bit more interesting. And do remember that this is all procedural. So if we go back and say change the tile pattern, this still works, right? All of the work that we've done works perfectly fine if we make changes to it. And let's say that we want this to rather be stone. It's really just as simple as changing the color of our bricks. And just like that, we've unlocked dozens upon dozens of brick textures. So I do hope that you found this interesting and I do hope that you found it helpful. So I appreciate you taking the time to watch this video. Please feel free to leave any questions or comments down below and I'll try to get to them. And I'll be seeing you in the next video.